Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hear my voice when I don't have my mic on. So, yes, Phil's back. It's good to have him back. Um, I hope he's well refreshed, although I have on pretty good authority that I think he worked the whole time he was gone. So, um, sounds like my kind of vacation. The flowers that we have here today are from Harold Langman's funeral. And so, very appropriately, we have a John Deere tractor in our midst. So, are there any other announcements? I think there's always room for your name on the ushers list. Um, so, if your name isn't on there, we have made a space for you. So, and it'll be back here for you to sign up. Good. So, if Pastor, I have one. I have one. Um, uh, 
Joyful Noise will practice after service today, and Joyful Noise will be singing on the 26th. So keep that in your on your memory list there. We always enjoy the kids singing. So we enjoy adults singing too. So with that, I want to just welcome our choir.
The choir would like to thank our accompanist this morning. She did a great job. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that is somewhat difficult trying to do that with recorded accompaniment, but I think we pulled it off. It yeah. looked like that to me. Yeah. So, I see there's no screen up in the back, so I will look this way, the way you're looking, and you can join me in the opening prayer. Oh God, our bread, our milk, and our honey, in the resurrection of your Son, you have brought us to your table. Feed us with your plenty and enlarge our table for all the hungry. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you. And next, I will be reading from Psalm 95. Harden not your hearts. Listen to God's voice. We are the people. We are the sheep, nurtured and led by God's hand. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great ruler above all gods. In whose hands are the depths of the earth and all the of the mountains. The sea belongs to God who made it and the dry land because God formed it. For the Lord is our God. We are the people of God's pasture, the sheep of God's hand. Hear the voice of the Lord today. When your forebears tested me and put me to the proof, though they had not, they, though they had seen my work. Therefore I swore in my anger that they should not enter my rest. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. And now you may rise as you are able and turn in your hymnals to number 89 and we'll sing joyful, joyful, we adore in verses 1, 2, and 4.
be seated. And may the children come forward. Good morning, ladies. Well, you're you're the sole man here. You're gonna be a hard one. <laughs> well, good morning. How is everything going today? Good. Is anybody tired here? Yeah. You know, we lose an hour in this crazy time when we spring forward. But it's, there's a word in there, spring. It's a catalyst to move us into, into better times, into warmer times. Not that these best, last few times have not been good. I think everything's been good. Don't you? Yeah. So, am I dressed a little different today? No. Yeah. Yeah, I don't usually walk around with animal prints on. And not usually on a Sunday morning. So, I am, because we're going to be learning about a woman who shows up at a well, and it is obvious to everyone around her that she is dressed a little different than the average group at the well. So, sometimes we meet people who might be dressed a little different than we are, or maybe their hair is worn a little different than we do. I can never complain. We just see that. But this is what we know. Despite the differences, despite the way they might seem a little different than we are, they're still God's children. And God makes room for everyone at the table. In fact, I believe you've read something about having room at the table. So there is always room at God's table for everyone, regardless of the way they're dressed, regardless of the way they wear their hair, regardless. Everyone is welcome. So is it no surprise that Jesus says, welcome, bring unto me all the children? Because children grow up to be adults that don't look like everybody else. And that's okay. Because God has a plan for each and every one of you. And you are called to that, pl that, that plan. What did we do at WOW this last week? Did we take a survey on what we were good at? Yes, we did. And we found out in the fourth grade group Hello, we have some leadership brewing in that fourth grade group. They may not look like it right now, but they're equipped to do that. And so, and we may not look, know what their leadership looks like, but we know that it will be of God because they are gifted. So, with that, let us pray. Father, you see us for who we are. You see us through the layers that we might put on, and you see our very hearts. And it is in that heart matter that it matters, that all of it matters. And so, Lord, always be present in our heart. Always be, let us be aware that you're present in our heart. As we as little people grow up and are bombarded by so many choices and so many things, and a strong desire not to conform, that we understand in you we are all the same. And so we pray this in Jesus' name, and they all said, amen. Ooh, I've got a variety here, guys. I don't know. I tried to load it up. Very good. Yeah. 
he came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, which was near the land Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Give me some water to drink. Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? If you recognized God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him and he would give you living water. Sir, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. Well, sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water again. Go, get your husband and come back here. I don't have a husband. You are right to say I don't have a husband. You've had five husbands and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped, worshiped on this mountain, but you and your people say that it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. The Father looks for those who worship him this way. God is spirit and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. I, I know that the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ, when he comes, he will teach everything to us. I am the one who speaks with you. And that was the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. So next we will have our next hymn, and rise as you are able to sing Fill My Cup, Lord. You will find it on page 641, and we will sing it twice.
You may be seated. I kind of like that, Phil. I kind of like that you went into that nice and soft, and then that next one, we were into a little bit bolder, bolder feeling. You know, and sometimes that's what happens. We come into religion a little bit soft, and then we get a bolder taste of what it is to be loved by God. Oh, I love this story. I love the story of this woman at the well. I love everything about, about it, um, what it speaks in so many ways. So, and there goes my water. I am really into this lately. I've dropped a bunch of things. So let me pray. Father, I love your words enacted. They come to life in new ways, deeper ways than I hear them when they are simply spoken or read. There is passion and understanding and mystery and riddle and love. Love for everyone, be it Jew or Gentile. Love for us. Help me today give these words of love to the ears and hearts of the congregation here and afar. In Christ's name, amen. Amen indeed. This robe that I have on is one that was made prior to um, COVID. At annual conference, there is a booth set up, and these women are called King, the King's Closet. And all the proceeds went to women at the well. So I thought it was very appropriate. And it just so happened, you know, there's a lady there, and she's like looking at me and looking at all the things. And she said, I really think this is the one for you. And I was like, well, orange is my favorite color. And so obviously it must have been it. And she said, it, it's called Moves with Grace. And of course, I laughed. Because I have two left feet, you know, I, I have a hard time going up and down stairs. I fall upstairs, um, not downstairs, I fall upstairs. And um, so there's, I, I just found it ironic. However, I do want to hope that grace moves through me. And so I, I like that idea a little bit better. And... It is a, a pattern that looks a little bit like a cat, and of course a cat moves with grace. So the scripture t text today is about grace. It's the grace of Christ to all who he meets. And it is about radical salvation. Quite often, they go together. We set this, the, the setting for this particular scripture. It is midday. And Jesus is at the well, and apparently there's nothing to dip into the well, you know, such as that cup on a rope type of thing that they would have had. And the disciples have left to go get food and, and into the city, the very city that this woman is coming out of. So chances are they would have met as she was coming to the well. And if they did, they would know something significant about this woman. And as readers, we don't necessarily catch this. And basically it's this. This is the wrong time of day to be gathering water. Let's face it. Typically the women of the, of the city came in the morning at daybreak and, and the, or maybe even a little bit before daybreak in case they wanted to stay a little longer. That's a little bit like coffee here in the morning at 7 a.m. You know, we come a little bit early so that we can, you know, get to kibitzing at the well. And so they would be kibitzing at the well. They'd be sharing their stories as they were gathering in that water. But, and of course they would do it because it's a cool time of day, right? I mean, Women, here, raise your hands if that doesn't make sense to you. It does make sense to us. You know, you would do it when it was cooler because the water was heavy. Plus, you would never do it at midday when it's hot. And that would mean your water would sit all night. And so you would want fresh water, fresh water to drink. So all of that just makes sense. And so... As these women would do the same thing that we do, and as these disciples have passed the Samaritan woman, they would know that this woman was not socially accepted. And Jesus, again, calls someone who is least likely to be healed, to be given new life. As we've been doing the Chosen series in this Lenten, 
so, this Lenten study, we see this played out in all the disciples that are called by him. They are the least likely. The women are the first to be healed with Mary and this woman at the well. And fishermen who are about to break the Sabbath and the lame, the ferocious, the tax collector, the disenfranchised. All the people least likely. And last Wednesday, someone even commented as these disciples' flaws came to the surface as they argued. One person at our study said, oh my goodness, the disciples' flaws are my flaws. We recognize the flaws in, in these people because they are very real people. Jesus didn't go in search of saints. <laughs> he went in search of sinners. It's important to know. Thank God. We know that God looks past our flaws and finds us worthy. And to this we would assign radical salvation. That he does look past everything that we are and have been. So for Jesus, waiting at the well, it is not lost on him who is coming at this time of day. But we know that this person sitting beside the well is God in human flesh. So what, getting water without a cup? Well, let's face it. Would that really be a problem for Jesus? Probably not. But this being Jesus, he knows what he knows about what is about to happen. And this is what the woman knows. A man sitting next to the well by this time of day is going to want more than just water from her. And that she knows that this well that she's drawing water from, well, it's significant to her whole ancestral history. She is not without understanding that a Messiah is coming. And she knows that as long as she stays near that, wall, that well, as long as she is able to draw, she is drawing, drawing from her rich ancestral heritage. And that she has great sin, according to her community. And in her life, she is not worthy to be addressed with compassion Compassion, not passion, compassion, especially by a man. But this is what Jesus knows. Jesus knows that this woman has been treated poorly by society. She, has no worth, she is of no worth to anyone, but yet she is of great worth to God. Hmm. Remember what we talked about with the kids? That we don't know where they're going, but God knows where they're going, and he's already equipping them with abilities that maybe they don't even realize. She is aware of her ancestral history. This is what Jesus knows of her. In fact, as a, comp a, comp a compromised, I'll get it, person, this history may be the only thing of worth to her. And she is looking for the Messiah. She would have had the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. She would have heard these preached all her life, read and preached all her life. She would have known that a Messiah is coming. She just doesn't have the rest of the books. So she's holding on to that little bit. And I know I've told this story before, how important scripture is and how important scripture is to them, but how important scripture is to anyone who is disenfranchised and is looking for help. Um, the story that I'm most familiar with is, is that of the Jews in the time of um, Hitler's invasion and how the, the Bibles were burnt and gotten rid of, and they had captured something out of the most driest part of, the, of all scripture, something out of Deuteronomy. But they read that and read that and read that until it became alive in them in ways they had no idea it would. Because it's a living word of God, right? And that's the same thing that she would have been hearing. She would have been looking for that Messiah. Little did she know. 
So I have to ask myself, what would our conversation with Jesus be at the well? Figuratively, at the well. I think maybe it might look a little bit like 7 a.m. coffee. Because it's our well time, at least for some of us. And so it, I think the question would be, what time would we show up? Is 7 a.m. too early? Some days it is, especially when they spring the clock, I heard. Would we want to sleep in like many people do on a Sunday? Or would you want to show up earlier so there, there was no line? Or show up early and share, just as the woman at the well did? Well, there's a stranger at the well. There's a stranger in our midst, and he's a man. Would we wait for others to approach this person, or would we go forward and approach them? Or would we be inclined to go ahead with, without fear? In our 7 a.m. coffee talk, being welcomed and transparent to the stranger among us would be something that we would do. We actually have practiced that a time or two, haven't we? If the well is our city, what would you tell the newcomer? Would you start with places to eat? Or things to do? Or would you be bold and start with places to worship? Would you offer to draw water for the stranger? Which would equate to taking them to church or to dinner or to help them in any way? And once Jesus told you who he was, that stranger that you've just met, well, what then? Would you then offer him water? Oh, well, it's Jesus. It's the Messiah. I better step up to my game here. And I better give him some water. Would we fall on our knees and worship him? Or would we drop our bucket and run home? Would we tell others what we saw? It just so happens that Jesus is on his way to Galilee, and he's passing through Samaria. It is the quick route, the route that passes these Jewish men through territory owned by Samaritans, which is a centuries-long dispute between the Jews and the Samaritans. And even though they're cousins in some way, shape, or form, because Joseph, Joseph would have been um, one of the twelve, of Jacob's sons. But this tribe they find unworthy. This Joseph's tribe, well, they're an unworthy group. And after this woman is told that Jesus is the Messiah, she does drop the water. And she runs into town to tell everyone of the Messiah who is here now. Would we? Would we be running? Or would we just maybe gather a few of our own friends and that's it? You know, we got to keep this as our little huddle here and we don't want to share this because we want to own this. Or would we be free to say, hey, I got to tell you about this guy I met at the well. He knew everything about me. He said things I haven't even said out loud myself. And then you just go ahead and spew it all out on everybody else so you know, they know that you are being very transparent. This is a captivating woman. She is, she's got an, she's got an audience. She draws an audience because this is the person least likely. This is radical salvation. I love this stuff. <sighs> all the sin, the depravity, the marginalization that she had been through, she has no problem telling everyone. And they drop what they're doing. And as a community, they bring him and his disciples to stay and to rest and to eat and to teach. And he does some healing. But this Jesus, our Jesus, is invested in them. He doesn't stay a day, he stays a while. 
And in that time, all that preaching and teaching and new ways of understanding that Torah and much of the Old Testament that they don't have, well, he brings it to life, present life, right now life. Do we bring this word of God to life, present life, right now life? Here's what I think we do that this woman did not. We let our past dictate our future. Not necessarily happy words, was that, Pastor? Did you know that with God, we only have a future? God could care less what we did in the past because God only sees us in the future. He is only here to bring us future. I love the fact that God not only forgives, but he forgets that he forgave. He goes, I forgave him? What did I have to forgive him for? You know, I love that. I don't necessarily, I don't have that ability. Every once in a while, that old niggling, you know, that thing in the back of my brain raises its ugly head and says, yeah, but remember when? No. God doesn't even do that. He just says, hey, I know what you're going to do next, and it's pretty amazing. And he wants to be a part of that next. Oh, I like that. And we have aha moments of God revealing himself to us, and we don't share them. We don't talk about them. In fact, it's frustrating as all get out. I'll be in with a bunch of pastors, and they'll say, so what's your aha moment? <laughs> well, four years ago. I'm like, four years ago? That's your last aha moment? Come on. It's an aha moment that I got up this morning. It's an aha moment that I was here on time. It's an aha moment that you're all here. Yeah, I like that. Oh, man, this woman, she had the biggest aha moment when she was told, you know, when she went and told everyone and everything that had gone on. Man, I think we fail to see our aha moments because we are too busy, which brings me to the next part. We are too busy. There's another thing I drop. If we allow our jobs our family, our hobbies, to outweigh our, outweigh our spiritual life and formation, we're too busy. I think Harold would tell us we're too busy. Because the one thing that I know about Harold, at least Harold in his later life, was that Harold always sat in his driveway and embraced life as it pulled up, as it walked by. A stranger was never met. Ah, that's such a Jesus thing. How dare he do that? Ah, Jesus is on his way home, and he stops off for quite some time. He takes the time. He is not too busy. And he trusted those he met. He heard those he met. He hurt with those he met. When was the last time we did, made, others' another's burden our burden? When's the last time that we shared that burden? I see it. I mean, I've seen it quite often in this church when hmm, someone's lost somebody and everybody gathers around and we share that burden. Or there's a family member in need of help and we share that burden. I like those moments. That's what we're all about. That's what we should be all about. So I've given you my readers digest abridged edition of the scripture because it is so impactful and important that a timeline cannot really hold it because this woman what she does 
I mean, it's one thing to lead your family to Christ. And then we can't even hold them together. This is the most least likely person that you can imagine that makes an entire community come to Christ. Wow. There will be people at the wells in our lives. They may not seem like us or dress like us or even talk like us. I remember when I moved to Oklahoma, people would say to me with my northern dialect, they'd go, you're not from around here, are you? After seven years in Oklahoma and I moved back north, and, I, and they would go, and I would slip up and say, you know, y'all need to come on over and we'll have dinner. Y'all, y'all come now. And they'd go, you're not from around here, are you? I guess I've just never been from around anywhere. And I think that's better. I actually think it's okay. Because everyone is thirsty. Even those that are not from around here. And we need to just offer them living water. It's what Jesus did. Amen. And now as our ushers scurry across the back and gather up their plates and extra hands to help them, let us prepare our hearts and minds for our offering. rise. Father, this offering, this offering is also a symbol of dipping into the well. And we ask that this, this pouring out be done to your edification, to your use, to the, the building of your church, your church universal. We ask that it also be in the building of our local church, 
but, oh Lord, in the building of the givers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. Um, so, are there any joys and concerns to be shared? Well, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, the daffodils arrived this week. And between Treyer and Dyser, we have sold over $2,000 worth. So quite, quite a, a blessing. And, but when, we got the, when the daffodils arrived, we got an extra box. So I have 25 bunches of daffodils left, and they're $10 each. And I also have about six mini daffodils, which are $20 each. So they're in my, they're in my car. So I can give them to you today. I know, I think there are some people that regularly buy them and didn't get them this year. So anyway, it's just a blessing that we had such a great turnout. And uh, if anybody wants any, I'll have them after church. Thank you so much for the support. Generous God. Wow, what a wonderful spring type thing. Daffodils. All right. I got one. Okay. Yeah. Um, a joy. Uh, Friday afternoon into the evening and all day yesterday I went up to Independence and took some training. I learned a few things. It was called basic lay servant training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And anyone can do it. Anyone that's a United Methodist or, I don't know. Wants you, to be a United Methodist. Or wants to be a United Methodist. Uh, it's the entry-level course. It's the easiest one. It's for everybody here that wants to learn more about United Methodism. Uh, our founder, John Wesley. Uh, you'll learn about the Book of Discipline, which tells us things. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of a dry read, but it, you know, it, it tells you some things you, you learn from it. And we can all do that. Uh, you learn how to be a better disciple. What's our job? We're supposed to go out and make disciples. Uh, not just sit in here on Sunday morning and listen to our pastor. We're supposed to go out there and make disciples. And this class kind of tells you how to do that. It, it's very practical. It's down to earth. The instructor was wonderful. And I could even understand it. So if I can get it, you can get it. And I challenge anyone in this room, anyone in this sanctuary, uh, I would even take the course again if you'd want to go along with me. So that's a joy. Indeed, generous God. Ooh, we're quiet. Oh, I think we need to lift up the families of Harold Langman, as well as uh, David Krafka, and remember them in our prayers as um, they lost people in the last week, 10 days. So, Generous God. All right. Well, I do want to encourage you to go to The Chosen on Wednesday for the popcorn. <laughs> no. Just, um, it's been a good study. It has been very enlightening. And... And it puts Jesus in a different light than maybe we've, we've kept, held him captive to a different thought process. So um, I would really encourage you to come. So with that, let us just center ourselves.
Father, all I can think about is praise today. Praise of all that you are doing in our midst, in, our, in, our, in ourselves, in who we are. And I praise you for new learning as Tom has gone off to, to classes that have made him dig a little deeper. And maybe that is a Lenten story right there, that we dig a little deeper. And what do we find? We find bulbs that, um, that create daffodils, that create funds to, for healing for other people in need. Ah, Lord, it always comes down to those in need, doesn't it? Those in need of, of just knowing your presence as we lift up both the Langman and the Kravka families, as they feel your presence and know your unending love. The love that is transformative, the love that is formative, the love that is given freely and at no cost. And so I ask, Lord, that you would help us to be that love to everyone to all we meet, at all the wells of our life. And that we be ever mindful that the well never dries up, as it says in your word when you taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please welcome our choir again for the call. Well, no, it's a different hymn. Surprise hymn. Right here.
Thank you, choir. In response, let us stand and sing, Jesus, name above all names, 2071 in your hymnal. And our benediction, we don't have it from last week. Okay. Um, Father, the Lord that is before us, the Lord that is within us, the Lord that surrounds us, be ever present in our coming and our going this week and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>